Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining uh, yet another eating event. Uh, my name is Eleonora Rosati, and I am uh, the director of the Institute, and it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's webinar, uh, which is meant uh, to discuss uh, uh, an emerging uh, area of the law, that is uh, the application of uh, patent uh, and regulatory rights uh, to personalized medicine, but it is also an opportunity to celebrate uh, uh, the research work that is conducted at IFIM, and in particular the recent publication of uh, Francesca Papadopoulos' book that uh, I hope you will have all an opportunity to read and explore in greater detail. So uh, I will be uh, uh, giving the floor to Francesca in a few seconds, but before I do that, I would like to express uh, uh, my gratitude to Francesca, not only for uh, being a great colleague and friend, but also for uh, giving us the opportunity to host uh, this webinar today. And I would like also to thank uh, all the speakers who have accepted the invite and uh, are here with us this afternoon, as well as all the uh, participants from uh, different uh, regions and countries in the world. And of course, I would like also to thank uh, our Amanuensis Alba for all uh, for all her help and support, so thanks so much, Alva. And uh, just uh, a technical uh, aspect, if anyone has questions or comments during the webinar, please do use the Q&A function and leave the chat for any technical problems that you might be experiencing. So let's get started. And I would like to ask Francesca to start from her book uh, to tell us uh, why you uh, thought that there was a need to explore this topic and what drove uh, in conducting the research that eventually was published as a, a new monograph. Uh, tell us all, Francesca. Thank you so much, Eleonora, for this very kind introduction. Um, so when I started doing research in the field of supplementary protection certificates, was uh, I was just writing uh, a few articles I realized that there is a need to explore the flexibilities of regulation and dive in the practicalities of the legislative text. Uh, and of course, at the time, there were a lot of rulings from the CDU uh, coming, and these implications were uh, very interesting. However, what triggered writing this book uh, even more was seeing actually how the SPC regulation interacts with the rest of the pharmaceutical regulatory framework namely the medical code, the pediatric regulation, the orphan drugs regulation, and the ATMP regulation. But to me, there is a, no doubt that the pharmaceutical industry operates today under a multi-layered system of rights and obligations. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, an environment, a commercial environment where national and EU competencies intertwine, providing for hybrid solutions that are not always so satisfactory. What is also very interesting is this, in this respect is the legislative architecture adopted in uh, regulatory systems, where regulations are combined with directives, making thus the impact of national legislation and national authorities of direct relevance. Furthermore, the system is to a considerable extent dependent on the role and legitimacy of a very special EU agency, the European Medicines Agency, uh, and concerns on the efficiency and transparency of the operations of the EMA, as well as its relations to national agencies are to this day expressed. What the book tries to do is to investigate these issues, adopting a holistic approach, looking into the system as a whole and under the lens of uh, legislative efficiency. And of course, it is, it is clear that efficiency in the regulation of the pharmaceutical market presupposes that the IP system, the regulatory rights, as well as other forms of activities and obligations um, on the pharmaceutical sector interact in a harmonious way. Uh, IP rights and regulatory rights will, of course, interact in the way the, um, the pharmaceutical industry excludes competitors from the market. They are part of pharmaceutical companies' business strategies, and they will at times interact in ways to hinder or stall access to medicines. Thus, even if we, in theory, if we would have a very efficient legislative act as such, uh, we have to be aware of the fact that this piece of legislation, this regulation, will not work in isolation. And this became very obvious under the COVID-19 pandemic. If you want to provide innovative, safe pharmaceuticals on a fast-track pace, fast pace, you will have to navigate around 
several layers of regulation and you might find out that patent rights are the least of your problem. I do not think that COVID-19 is so exceptional in this respect, to be honest, um, taking into consideration the special nature of pharmaceuticals as such, there will always be a context to relate to, a context under which even the most balanced and efficient piece of legislation could turn out to be a legislative catastrophe. And the holistic approach uh, I'm proposing in the book is unfortunately missing both in the system as it is now, but also in the proposed changes in the latest commission action plan on IP and the pharma strategy published in 2020. And the question is why? Is it because it is yet not obvious that the interaction in such an innovation and regulation intense market as the pharmaceutical one needs a whole scale grip or is it because such a holistic all-in-one perspective may not be a quick fix in fact and may require tackling with some particularly difficult issues such as the division of competencies between the EU and member states? Um, the answer to these questions remain unclear, but what the book tries to do is to provide an illustration as to why addressing these issues is of key importance and explain why efficiency in legislation may not be achieved when the context under which these legislative acts are to operate is not taken into consideration. And personalized medicine constitutes a milestone in medical and pharma research, and thus a context that could not be disregarded in this respect. And while it seems that the advancements of personalized medicine are already here, I'm wondering whether the legislator is actually ready for them. At the same time, it feels that the upcoming challenges of adapting the regulatory regime to apply uh, to personalized medicine constitute a great occasion to take a step, step back and look at the system as a whole, uh, try to match the needs and challenges faced with this specific new subject matter. So my hope is that the critical discussion of the reg regulatory system and the way it interacts with the patent system presented in the book could be used as a starting point for the discussion on how to, in an efficient and timely manner, regulate personalized medicine. So I'm very excited and honored to be here today uh, and to be able to discuss this, for me, very interesting subject with an amazing group of panelists with different profiles and different experience in the field, both of regulatory rights, IP, and personalized medicine. And we will start this seminar uh, with short presentations by our speakers, and then we will continue with the discussion and of course, possibility for um, all of you listening to us to intervene with the Q and A's. Uh, I would like to present our speakers in an alphabetical order. Uh, Professor Duncan Ma Matthews is the former director of the Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute and a member of the Center for Commercial Law Studies. Uh, he is, uh, has acted as an advisor to the European Patent Office, the European Commission, um, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Health Organization. Ulf Peterson is a professor of law and director of the Institute for Innovation and Social Change at the Law Department, um, University of Gothenburg. Roberto Romandini is a legal member of the Board of Appeal of the EPO um, with previous experience both as a practicing lawyer and as a, a researcher, a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition in Europe. Anna Tillus is partner at Serial Law Firm in Stockholm, Sweden, specializing in life sciences. Um, Laura Walter is a, a R&D specialist um, for a project called Indigo at the University of Luxembourg, but she's also finalizing her PhD thesis uh, in the field of personalized medicine. So very interesting to hear her views as well. Yves Lund is the Vice President of Global IP for the Bavaria Nordic Group and has the operational responsibility to develop, define, implement and enforce IP strategies. And Joaquin Yildirim is a European patent attorney by profession and works as the head of the intellectual property at Explain Biopharma, a Swedish pharmaceutical development company in the field of biosimilars. And uh, I would like to ask our first speaker, Professor Duncan Matthews, to 
to start by setting the scenery for today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I'm going to share my screen. So thank you to Francesca and Eleonora for the kind invitation. I, I'm going to explain why I think this is a very timely and important discussion. Uh, and I believe that Francesca's book is also a valuable contribution to this debate. The definition of personalized medicine that I'm going to adopt is taken from the Council of the European Union conclusion on personalized medicines. You can see it on the screen now. Um, and by way of summary, um, I, I think it's well understood that uh, modern advances in personalized medicine um, use technology that can confirm an individual's fundamental biology, DNA, RNA, or proteins, and that this can also then confirm uh, disease uh, propensity. Um, so revealing mutations in DNA uh, can uh, lead to information about a patient's likelihood of developing cystic fibrosis, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, sickle cell anemia, etc. cetera. Um, and in some of my own recent work, together with Timo Minson, uh, Anna Nordberg and others, we've been looking at another aspect of this. Uh, we've been looking at uh, CRISPR human germline editing, which is perhaps beyond uh, the scope of what we're discussing today, but a related area. The book that we are in part here to celebrate here today makes, uh, uh, I think, a valuable contribution to uh, this debate in a number of respects. Uh, and I'm going to outline briefly why I think Francesca's book uh, addresses important issues of personalized medicines in three contexts. The first of these relates to the relationship between personalized medicine and the conditions for qualification of a drug uh, as an orphan disease. On pages 191 and pages 100, 212 of the book, uh, Francesca explains that while personalized medicines, especially biomarkers, will be used for um, investigations into treatments for orphan diseases, uh, the application of personalized medicines is much broader than this and can be used to identify different susceptibility groups uh, in the ways that I have also just described. And, and the book points out that the question that emerges is what is the difference between a group of patients suffering from an orphan disease and a very small group of patients with particular susceptibility to a common disease? And how do we reconcile these concepts in terms of personalized medicine? The second respect in which the book addresses personalized medicine um, is in the context of advanced therapy medicinal products and the regulation of this, um, in which the book on page 212 uh, discusses personalized medicine as a concept which is difficult to commercialize if there is relatively low demand for specialized treatments and for access. Um, and this can be exacerbated by traditional regulatory regimes. Um, so the book addresses both these concepts, I think, in a very helpful way. The third aspect that the book deals with in terms of personalized medicine is in relation to exclusivities. And I know we have a number of learned speakers who will be addressing the concept of exclusivities uh, throughout the proceedings today. Um, and I'll also refer to this later uh, in my talk uh, because uh, Francesca in her book refers to a specific um, paper which has been written, which addresses this, I think, in a helpful way. Before I do that, I, I wanted to briefly draw on, I think, three questions which will be coming up uh, during today's discussions. The first of these is the question of whether personalized medicine methods are patentable. And I believe we will have important discussions today about whether products of nature 
constitute patentable subject matter, about the question of the patentability of genes, of methods of treatment, of first and second medical use claims, and of dosage regimes. So I think there are a complex web of issues relating to patentability which will be relevant today. The second question I think we will no doubt discuss is whether or not IP rights are an effective mechanism for ensuring a fair balance between the objectives of incentivizing investment in research and development on the one hand and ensuring fair and equitable access to personalized treatment on the other hand. And the third question I think we will no doubt discuss further is the potential effects of the Myriad decision, particularly in the US context, um, and the effect that this might have either on chilling uh, development of personalized medicines in the sector, uh, or of um, having the opposite effect of improving access to technologies. Um, of course, I'm sure the audience today will be familiar with the US Supreme Court decision in Associated Association for Molecular Pathology uh, and Myriad Genetics in, in 2013. Um, and I would just simply show you again, the uh, Supreme Court's uh, decision was that the naturally occurring DNA segments of BRCA1, BRCA2 were considered to be a product of nature and not patent eligible, um, merely because the product of nature was isolated from its uh, natural environment, but the complementary DNA was considered patent eligible because it was not naturally occurring. Of course, we also know that by the time the Supreme Court decision was handed down, uh, the term of patent protection was drawing to an end. Uh, and the real value um, of the uh, myriad genetics technique uh, lay not in the patents themselves, but in what have been called the role of patents as serving as aggregators of data. In her book, Francesca makes explicit reference to a paper uh, written by Dan Burke, um, which uh, makes this argument uh, very well. And according to Burke, the Myriad case indicates that patents are serving as aggregates of data or as he puts it, coordination points because whereas the data themselves are um, not claimed in the patents, uh, what the patents themselves facilitated was the creation of large, very useful and potentially very commercially lucrative uh, databases. And Myriad's databases, of course, could not have been achieved without uh, the patent protection uh, afforded to these diagnostic kits. So I'm not going to say any more about this uh, for the time being. Uh, I'm going to draw my conclusion to a close uh, and would simply really, I think, commend to you Francesca's book uh, as being timely uh, and important in its contribution uh, to today's discussions. And I'll now hand over to my colleagues and look forward to the other presentations and discussions today. Thank you so much, Duncan. Um, and now I would like to ask Laura and Roberto to continue and share their screen. Uh, not at the moment. Uh, okay. uh, sorry, wait a moment. I'm. Uh... Can you hear me? One slide back, Roberto. Is the right uh, not? It's okay. Or... One slide back, please. Ah, one slide. 
Look, can you see the comment? It's all good. Okay, so thank you for uh, inviting Kai to this panel today. Uh, thank you, Francesca. Uh, thank you, Eleonora. The topic of our presentation will be the question of what exclusivities are available for innovation relating to personalized medicine. And uh, it will be divided in three parts. In uh, the first, Laura will introduce the concept of personalized medicine, which is, as Duncan has explained, of course, not a legal concept, but only a term adopted in some policy document, a scientific article with very often a different meaning and scope. In the second part, uh, uh, I briefly mention the exclusivity available for pharmaceutical innovation, which have been beautifully explained in the systematic relationship in the book of Francesca. And in the third part, Laura will discuss whether and to what extent these exclusivities are applicable to personalized medicine, which, as already mentioned by Francesca, represented the topic of the dissertation of Laura, which I supervised when I was a research fellow. Since the time is limited and the topic is broad, we will limit our discussion to one or maybe two examples, and we will not include all available exclusivities and analysis. Now let's turn to the concept of personalized medicine. Laura, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Roberto, for the introduction. The term personalized medicine was used for the first time, to the best of my knowledge, back in 1998 by Professor Kevin Chain in his monograph speaking about pharmacogenetics and variations in drug responses and the technological potential of personalized medicine. At that time, such term existed in the English language, but without medical connotations, it had a broader social context. Although the term personalized medicine and the hypothesis that each individual might react differently to the same treatment and the gen genetic variations uh, may be responsible for this different reaction, together with other facts is relatively recent, seeking the best suitable treatment for a certain patient is as old as the attempt itself to cure. New, however, are the precision and technologies which can enable the treatment to be the most beneficial for a certain patient or patient subpopulations. In addition, personalized medicine is a multidisciplinary undertaking, and there is neither one official commonly agreed and universally accepted definition, nor special legal regulations exclusively dedicated to personalized medicine. Uh, nevertheless, one cannot complain about the lack of definitions offered by different scholars, official institutions, medical practitioners, and others. I provide you here with an insight into a few of them. Council of Europe definition was already mentioned, mentioned by Duncan. The second is developed by the European Society of Radiology and focuses on accommodation of individual differences. It is followed by the US President's Council definition, which is similar to the definition of the Council of Europe, yet speaks directly about classifying individuals into subpopulations. And the last definition is the one provided by a group of researchers which concluded holistic research on the definition, reviewing the literature available at the time 2013. It is quite comprehensive, although it does not contain all the features of personalized medicine. So there are though common features in the different definitions. Personalized medicine is a medical model or approach. It is supported by genetics and different omics involving molecular profiling of either patients or their diseases, but other patient characteristics are not excluded. It is um, with molecular profiling, stratification or classification of patients uh, into subpopulations with common characteristics, either genetic or other is achieved. And this leads to customization or tailoring of the treatment to a certain patient population which in turn leads to enhanced treatment of a certain patient's population. Roberto? Yes. Now, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, now mention briefly uh, some of the reported exclusivities that are available for pharmaceutical innovation. Uh, we will consider patents uh, and regulatory exclusivities, with the exception of fund drugs, and we will mention SPC. Uh, Orphan drugs SPC are extensively analyzed in the book of Francesca, so I allow myself to refer 
uh, to the monographic analysis of Francesca, which is uh, very clear, my view, uh, for the backgrounds. Uh, for the purpose of our analysis, I would like only to recall some main features of the patent system and the rule of exclusivities for preparing the first part of, uh, of the presentation. Now, uh, patents are uh, traditionally considered in the field of pharmaceutical uh, as being both necessary and beneficial for traditional drugs. And the reason are uh, the specific future of this market, which requires high development cost in case of medicinal product, including a, a, a new active ingredient not authorized before. At the same time, after such development has been completed, uh, at the same time, they implies very low limitation cost for competitors. So therefore, very often, a generic entry means uh, a great impact on the price which uh, the originator can obtain on the market. Now, whether this will be true also for personalized medicine, where, as Francesco observed at page 212 for the of his analysis, uh, the market is uh, narrower and the cost of uh, the individualized drugs very often uh, very high is a different topic. Uh, what I would uh, now uh, mention in this context, uh, recalling briefly the main, uh, the main future of the patents uh, as use as alios that grant the exclusivity rights, uh, that at the same time uh, patents present some uh, shortcomings, deficiency, uh, in uh, supporting pharmaceutical uh, uh, innovation. And what are these deficiencies? Uh, they main, uh, the main uh, advantage is uh, they can be applied for uh, uh, relative uh, early in the development process. Even if they represent an exposed incentive, uh, an application for uh, a new active ingredient, but also even of a second medical indication, do not require usually uh, data in vivo in order to support uh, the description. Uh, data in vitro can be sufficient. Uh, the advantage is also to apply uniformly to all invention, but at the same time, they present uh, at least two shortcomings. Uh, the first is that uh, as a pointed out particular in some medical literature, the probabilistic property right to and uh, they consider to be so fundamentally for the inherent uncertainty that uh, underlies the patent system and, and which is a particular relevant in the field of pharmaceutical product. And what does it mean? Uh, two reasons are mentioned for this uh, conclusion. The first one uh, is uh, an empirical observation. Uh, few patents are litigated, but when this happens, uh, a high number of them are declared invalid. Uh, empirical evidence suggests that uh, half of the patents litigated in the United States are declared invalid, and two-thirds of the patents subject to an opposition in the, in the European context are partly or completely revoked at the end of the proceedings. Second, a related point is a, is a normative observation the, 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 which contributes to this uncertainty. The legislation governing patents uh, incorporates a standard which requires a value judgment based on multiple factors. In particular, the most important requirement, obviousness, is based on the notional criteria of the skill of the art and ask the question of what the skill of the art would have done at the critical date the patent was applied for. This requires an hypothetical and multifactorial assessment which includes a subjective element which can never be fully eliminated, even if the PO and National Court also, also National Patent Office, as UK Patent Office, has developed a detailed a uniform methodology for the assessment of this requirement. And this a subjective element, which is immanent in assessing obviousness as a standard-like requirement, as a consequence that two different instances, two different examiner, one court, one examiner, can come to opposite conclusion in matter of obviousness, even if they consider the same claim, the same subject matter, the same prior art and they apply the same methodology, like for instance, the problem solution approach in the European context. These shortcomings of, uh, of this inherent uncertainty of, of the patent system has led the leading patent judge in the UK in a famous revocation action to conclude that the patent are inefficient tool to support product development and that uh, a workable system to develop a product on the basis of, of, of technical teaching already disclosed in the past would be likely needed and beneficial, in particular in the field of medicine. 
Now, actually, it is a workable system uh, which does not provide obviousness as a requirement for conferring a protection is actually already in place in Europe and is provided under the Directive 2003 and the associated legislation concerning uh, marketing authorization, legislation which provides one period of data exclusivity subject to some requirements. Now, what are the main features of regulatory exclusivity? I allow myself still to refer again to the book of uh, Francesca. Uh, they apply only to product which may not be placed on the market without a marketing authorization. They do not confirm a user exclusivity. They only shield the company from competing application concerning the same medicinal product which refer to the data provided by the first applicant. At the same time, they have a, a, a significant advantage with respect to patents. Whether the substance is new, obvious, novel or known does not matter. What is protected are the investment in collecting clinical preclinical data. Therefore, also unpatentable and off patent substances are eligible for protection, provided, of course, that they were never authorized in the past. If they were authorized in the past, there are room for obtaining some additional protection in the form of a second medical indication, one plus year of protection. And that will be addressed by, by Laura because this form of protection may be significant for personalized medicine. Now, I leave out uh, the shortcomings, uh, the main of which is uh, the fact that rural facilities represent the ex post incentive. They apply only after the whole development process has been completed. I would only mention uh, the other form of protection, which are supplementary protection or certificate, which postulates both the existence of a patent covering the product and a marketing authorization covering that product, a product being an activity ingredient or a combination of activity ingredient. The effect of an SPC is to extend the patent protection conferred by a basic patent designating the application for the subject of the marketing authorization, particularly for the TV ingredient or the combination of TV ingredient covered by the marketing authorization. This means that this type of protection postulated existence of patent protection if a patent in force. We will not treat for the SPC. I refer for the analysis of this legislation to Laura. And now I ask Laura the question of whether, to what extent, uh, these regulatory and not regulatory exclusivities, patent based and not patent based exclusivities, uh, are available or applicable to personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is not possible to provide an exhaustive answer to this question, but we can discuss two examples one of personalized and the second of individualized treatment, which are considered to be part of personalized medicine approach and to assess whether patent protection and regulatory exclusivities could apply. The first one is the inter uh, invention that establishes the link between the specific biomarker and the patient group which responds to certain treatment. And the second example is autologous cell therapies. We will start with the first one. The first example concerns a scenario where a company has identified uh, that pre-selected patients with certain biomarkers could respond favorably to the treatment. An example for this invention is provided in the application P69490, which was a subject of proceedings before the boards of appeal. The invention concerned purposefully selective treatment or prevention of a patient subpopulation identified by the certain biomarkers. The applicant formulated the claim with the second medical use format a purpose-bound product claim defining a composition for use in the treatment in a person having characteristics of a prodromal dementia patient, which is integrally detectable by measuring an amount of certain cerebrospinal fluid markers. Accordingly, certain patients having said markers benefit from the prevention of dementia with the composition, while those who have not these markers can avoid unnecessary treatment. Are such claims allowable under the EPC? I'll back up this next slide. This could appear to be problematic in view of previous case law boards uh, on patient subgroups, in particular uh, in the decision in T23396, 
which besides the criteria that the choice of the new patient group must not be arbitrary, there must be a functional relationship between the particular new patient group, its subjects, um, physiological or pathological status, and the therapeutic or pharmacologic effect achieved, and that the new patient group must be physiologically or pathologically distinct from the one in the prior art introduced stringent criterion namely the requirement that the new patient group must not overlap with the group previously treated with that substance. However, subsequent case law has relaxed these requirements. Furthermore, the board uh, was further not applying this test homogeneously. So for example, in T10809, the newly defined and claimed patient group could hypothetically overlap with the one of the state of the art. Um, next slide. Uh, the decision T64919 in the field of personalized medicine has explicitly ruled that overlapping of patient groups, the newly defined with the one of prior art, does not make per se claim not allowable. Indeed, novelty of the claim was objected for the reason that some of the patients have been in a, in a, uh, inevitably or inherently treated with the claimed composition whereby inevitability was based on statistical assumptions. There was no diagnostic test that indicated in the claim, which could be invoked to establish novelty. The new defined patient group basically could overlap with the one from the state of the art, as at least based on statistical assumptions, patients already treated with the composition could carry the relevant markers. The boards held that the assessment of novelty cannot be made based on probable or statistical considerations. And what is relevant is what has been made available and not what may have been inherent in what was made available. As it is purpose-bound product claim, the crucial question is whether the purpose of the treatment is selective and purposefully targeted treatment of a specific patient subpopulation does not pertain to the prior art. And uh, therefore, the overlapping argument was expressly excluded from the novelty destroying aspects, thereby even further deviating from the board's rulings in the previous cases to 396, which explicit, explicitly required the new group of subjects to be not overlapping with the previous group. Therefore, if this case law is followed in future, the personalized medicine approach of purposefully selective treatment of a patient subpopulation identified by biomarkers may be patentable even when the selected patient subgroup inherently may overlap with the previous treated population. Next slide. Also, regulatory exclusivities might be applicable to pharmaceuticals, also those under uh, the personalized medicine concept. However, there might be some hurdles for personalized medicine drugs to obtain the classic A plus two exclusivity. As to obtain A plus two year exclusivity, the active ingredient has to be new, meaning not authorized before. If the composition does not contain a new active, no A plus two year exclusivity is awarded. And this will be decisive since most of personalized medicine inventions concern existing drugs, the active substance of which have been previously authorized. However, there is a chance to obtain the plus one market exclusivity to the aforementioned A plus two, if the new indication is of significant clinical benefit, as it does not require a new active substance. There is a role of criteria in order to obtain plus one exclusivity on the slide, uh, such that the active is already authorized by the say same marketing authorization holder and thus pertains to the global marketing authorization and that the new indication must be of significant benefit. Yet what is not clear, about of this next slide, is whether indication strict sense or also other aspects of a drug may deserve plus one year of exclusivity, especially concerning that significant clinical trials may have been conducted to substantiate other relevant therapeutic features of a drug, or they can uh, even bring significant benefit, yet not dedicated for the treatment of a new disease or condition, but rather the same disease as it's uh, with personalized medicine. 
And there is no definition of indication in EU pharmaceutical legislation. However, the notice to applicants state that indication should define target disease condition, distinguishing between treatment, prevention, and so on. And it should define the target population, especially when the restrictions to the patient population apply. Therefore, I ask whether clinical trials for the same drug, for the same therapy, yet for a targeted treatment of a newly defined subpopulation and possibly the new adjusted dosage can obtain for the drug an extra year of market exclusivity. If we have time, I would hand over to Roberto with the second example. Uh, yes, uh, the second example that we have selected uh, are in the lies of robust treatment. And uh, this approach, the, which include uh, autologous gen therapy, autologous stem therapy, but uh, to which we can also reconduct uh, chimeric antigen receptor cell therapy, uh, which is considered to be a type of personalized therapy where the T cell of a patient are taken from the patient, engineered in vitro in order to let them to express a chimeric antigen receptor, and then reinforce back to the patient in a process with the literature called adopting cell therapy for clinical effect. Also in this case, fundamentally, in this approach, all this example of autologous treatment that share to some extent similar steps. There is a first step which is the extraction of the biological material from the patient. Then a second step which is the extracorporal manipulation of this material with the resulting product. And finally, the reinsertion of this autologous preparation in the body of the patient. Uh, when uh, in my dissertation 10 years ago, I analyzed uh, the patentability of stem cells related invention, I prepare starting uh, from some uh, pending application or granted patent, a uh, uh, simplified uh, schema for autologous cell therapy. Uh, we were uh, the three steps, isolation of the biological material, manipulation in vitro, and uh, insert of the material back to the patient are represented. Now the question, assuming that this procedure is present some technical feature which confer novelty and inventive step to the subject matter, uh, there are obstacles in obtaining a patent for this treatment. Now uh, an applicant under the European Patent Convention, of course, now an applicant uh, who try to formulate different category of claims. And the first category of claim, which can be found in some PCT application originally filed in the United States or claiming an American priority, uh, are claims directed to the whole procedure encompassing both the initial step of removing the biological material from the patient and the final step of inserting such biological material in the patient. Now, uh, there is an unanimous opinion also in literature that such claims are not allowable under European patent law because they concern a medical treatment performed on the human body. And therefore, Article 53 would apply. And that's also the view of the European Patent Office that some the application where such claims uh, were included, uh, they raise an objection under Article 53. Now, what, uh, uh, what about, however, uh, the second type of claims which can be found in this application? That is a claim which is limited to the step performed in vitro in order to manipulate the cells after they have been derived from the body of the patient. Uh, example for this method claim, uh, I found one of them, uh, time I drafted my dissertation, in an uh, patent application and a patent granted, uh, they concern the use of the cells uh, to prepare, to manufacture a final preparation with specific uh, technical feature that should be inserted. Uh, what about the status of this method claim? Are still in conflict with Article 53 of the European Patent Convention? Now, the question was uh, discussed in the literature and uh, some authors uh, come to the conclusion that this claim should not be allowed. And they mentioned two reasons. The first one was a reference to the guidelines. The guidelines uh, uh, at uh, in the current version 2022, uh, chapter G 
to, for, to one, they provide that the treatment of body tissue, fluids, after they have been removed from the human animal body, are not excluded from patentability as long as these tissue fluid are not returned to the same body. From this indication, the inference as contrary is that when the treatment of the body tissue occur in vitro, but the body tissue, the fluid must be returned to the human body from which they were derived, in this case, the exclusion should apply. Now, of course, uh, the guidelines are not binding uh, on the Board of Appeal unless they codify an interpretation adopted by the larger Board of Appeal. In that case, the Board of Appeal should not depart. It can, under the Scandinavia variant of binding precedent adopted by the case of the Board of Appeal and the rule of procedure, it can refer again the question, but in principle cannot depart. But since this passage of the guidelines is not adopting an interpretation of the PC endorsed by the larger Board of Appeal, are not binding. The origin of this passage of the guidelines, which were included actually in the first version of the guidelines adopted at, at the, in the 80, when the office started its activity, goes back to British case law, in particular to a decision of the Cape Patent Office adopted in 1972, and then in, confirmed by the Court of Appeal and concerning a dialysis process where the claim were directed uh, only to the uh, manipulation in the device of the blood isolated from the patient. And despite that, the patent office came to the conclusion that uh, the, 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 that was a medical treatment excluded from protection. And uh, this passage is taken also from the, the guidelines of the, of the patent office in the United Kingdom. And, um, they are not binding uh, on, the, on the Board of Appeal, of course, but the literature has provided a theological argument why uh, the interpretation that line this passage should be followed. And uh, what is this theological argument? Uh, the theological argument is that uh, the purpose of Article 53 of the PC is uh, to keep the freedom, the therapeutic freedom of the patient or hospital when they intend to select the most suitable treatment for the patient. Patent granted on drugs, medical devices, do not limit this freedom because the drugs pre-exist to the treatment and an hospital can purchase this drug on the market. Therefore, the only limitation to the freedom of the hospital is in the choice, in the selection of the supplier. But once the hospital is bought on the market, is ready to pay the required price on the market for the drug, it can apply this drug in any treatment without any limitation. By contrast, a part of the medical treatment would limit the therapeutic freedom because in order to practice the invention would be necessary to obtain a license. That's the traditional justification why European patent law deny the allowability of medical claims for medical treatment, but allow the patentability of product used in this treatment. Now, why in this case the doctor in the literature, important author like Mouffe and Kras, they make this ethological argument for an application by knowledge or extensive interpretation of the exclusion. It's because if one would allow the claim directed to the manipulation vitro of the autologous cells, indeed it would grant a monopoly which control the whole procedure because it, these autologous cells prepared for the treatment, they not pre-exist to the treatment. They are created within the context of a therapeutic treatment. And for this very reason, such claim limited to the in vitro method would actually imply patent protection for the whole procedure. This is the theological argument. It would be, of course, available to counter argument. Uh, for reason of time, I want only to mention what is uh, the case law of the Board of Appeal on this topic. I find only one decision dealing with the method claim limited to the in vitro manipulation of biological material, in this case, actually blood isolated from the patient, which were challenged under Article 53. And in this case, uh, the Board of Appeal came to the conclusion that the discussion could not apply. And for what reason? Uh, the reason was that uh, Admittingly, the blood fraction which the claim method was performed necessarily originate, that's the observation of the board, from an animal human body and is ultimately delivered to a human or animal body. However, the claim method is not performed on the human animal body, but is an extracorporeal method performed on a blood fraction, 
which is an organic fluid and not a complete body. Moreover, the very purpose of the invention is to perform the treatment of the blood fraction spatially and temporarily separated from the operation or extraction and delivery of the blood from and to the patient. So that's the reason in which most may be found in this decision. Uh, if we, this case law will be followed, uh, which corresponds also to the current practice of the European Patent Office, it would mean that claim directed, for instance, to the manufacturer in vitro of CAR T cell uh, for purpose of therapy would be allowable under European patent law. Now, some reference to the literature, of course, uh, uh, the book of Francesca, uh, I refer to my dissertation from the analysis of this specific topic of autologous stem cells, where I discussed this ethological argument extensively. And uh, of course, also to the dissertation of Laura Valtere, which is also the basis for this presentation today. Thank you so much for your attention. And now the floor back to Francesca. Thank you so much, Roberto and Laura, for this very interesting presentation. And now we uh, invite uh, uh, Liv Estelun to give us uh, the US perspective. Lee, are you with us? No, it seems there is some technical issue with Lee. Uh, then can I ask then Hannah to uh, present? Yes. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Uh, do you think you can put it on presenter's mode? Because now we can see all slides. Can you still see the no. whole screen? No, you yes. have stopped sharing. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so. so what about now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much Fran Francesca and Eleonora for inviting me uh, for this very interesting seminar. Uh, I will take the opportunity to uh, give you a presentation on personalized medicine in Sweden. So uh, Sweden has a very ambitious life sciences strategy. Sweden aims to be a leading life sciences nation. Uh, and an important part of this strategy is to have a very well-developed personalized medicine. Uh, so this is really, really a hot topic in Sweden as in many other countries. Uh, earlier we saw some other definitions of uh, personalized or precision medicine. Uh, this is the Sweden's National Life Sciences Strategies definition. And you can see it on the screen. Uh, it is, uh, has a lot in common with, with other definitions, of course. So healthcare is currently being transformed through increased opportunities for personalized medicine. Uh, and this transformation is of course very challenging uh, and existing working practices and priorities, structures and, and uh, basically uh, all work methods are to be changed, in, at least in some way. Uh, and as many reports in Sweden have uh, identified, there is really a need of uh, a huge 
collaboration between uh, many important actors. Uh, so there will be a need for a close collaboration with, the, with industry and relevant government agencies, universities and, and other institutions. So, so this is really something that needs to be done in collaboration. Uh, and as we have already heard, um, analysis um, of uh, gene, genes are very important uh, to develop the uh, personalized medicine. Uh, and of course, there is one very important part here, uh, which is health data, which is really crucial for, for uh, personalized medicine. Uh, and as we have already discussed uh, patents and, and the importance of patents and also the challenges, uh, I will focus uh, on some data related uh, issues and, and um, challenges here. Um, coming back to, to the life, Sweden's life science strategy, uh, it has also been pointed out in that one that we really need a better utilization of health data. That is really a key to be able to, to take lead in life sciences. This is something which is really important. Uh, and there has been some, some challenges identified. Uh, yeah, I have already mentioned that this is a collaboration between several actors and for you non-Swedes, uh, I, can, I can tell that Sweden is a quite small country, but it is, uh, we have 21 regions uh, in Sweden, which are uh, very decentralized. Uh, and when it comes to healthcare, the decision-making is basically done on a regional basis, which means that for, for such a small country, we have 21 regions uh, that in a way has their own strategies, even though we have this national life science strategy, uh, but the healthcare is, is to a large extent uh, done uh, within, within the regions. Uh, and there are some legal barriers uh, that, uh, for example, mean that patient data can be shared between different regions as the main rule. And I will come back to that. Uh, and also on the technical sides, side, uh, there is a, an ongoing debate uh, within the regions, but also uh, within all uh, governmental authorities in Sweden, whether you can use cloud-based solutions or not for storing and sharing the data, which of course is very challenging because if all the regions needs to, need to develop their own cloud solutions uh, and, and storage and, and have the uh, IT infrastructure in place, uh, that will be even more challenging to, to, for the development. So that would not only be a uh, scientific, uh, part of it, it will also be a, a, a technical challenge. Uh, so, as in, in uh, many other countries, uh, healthcare and patient data is protected by more than one uh, legislation. Uh, so, we have, of course, the GDPR, uh, but also in Sweden, we have the Patient Data Act. and patient confidentiality, which is, which is a very, uh, very strong protector of, of healthcare data. Uh, and as you probably, all of you probably know, uh, under the GDPR, data concerning health is a special category of personal data. And the starting point is that such a uh, processing of such data is prohibited. Uh, but there are some exceptions uh, which are relevant here. Um, and for example, uh, it is allowed to process uh, health related data for a medical diagnosis uh, and also uh, for, for processing which is necessary for reasons of public interest in the area of public health. Uh, but you need to have, have uh, 
uh, member state law to rely on. And also the, uh, it is important that the persons who are uh, processing the data, they are, that, they are, um, that they are bound by professional secrecy. Um, so, so there are some, some uh, possibilities, but also some restrictions. Um, but despite the GDPR, uh, the, under the current legislation, it is usually not possible to share patient data between different care providers, regions, and municipalities due to this patient confidentiality. So there is a challenge uh, for uh, care providers and, and uh, uh, regions to share data, which is really important for, for the uh, personalized medicine and, and the development of the same. Uh, of course, there are some possibilities for coherent medical records keeping, but normally that is for, for the purpose to be able to give the, the medical care and not for, for, the, uh, for the development and, and the uh, scientific um, analysis. Uh, but I should also mention here that this is something which is uh, very much um, a, the, the legislator is looking into this topic um, as we speak mainly. Uh, so there is uh, hopefully some changes to come which will facilitate uh, the sharing of data. Um, and yeah, as you uh, probably all know, uh, the price for personalized medicine is often set to a very high level which means that the cost of use is very high. Uh, and a general concern, uh, mainly among payers, is whether the new products provide sufficient health benefits to justify the high costs. So the data collection and analysis is not only crucial for developing uh, personalized medicine, but also that is the foundation for pricing and payment models. Uh, and currently uh, in, in uh, in Sweden, as in many other countries, uh, new standards are under development and, and are identified as needed for health economic assessments. Uh, and we need to find a way how to assess these therapies uh, and how should uh, payment models be constructed. constructed. Uh, and uh, at least for Sweden, it seems that some kind of risk sharing payment models are, are likely to, to be um, used. Uh, and yeah, the Swedish government has assigned the, the reimbursement, uh, Dental and Pharmaceutical Benefits Agency, which is the reimbursement authority uh, to, to further investigate and develop methods for, for health economic assessments of personalized medicine. Uh, and, and that is something that, um, that has a lot of um, attention for, for the time being, and uh, there is more to come. Um, and I think that we will see quite many regulatory challenges uh, and also some case law on, on this for the years to come. Thank you, over to you, Francesca. Thank you so much, Hannah. This is very interesting. Sweden is one of the countries with a, a extreme focus on personalized medicine. So a lot of things happen in, in the research institutes and the universities. And I, I know researchers complain that the legal framework is quite, um, there, it is limiting their activities too much. So thank you for, for this uh, presentation. It was very interesting. And now I think we can ask Lee to introduce <laughs> us to, to the US perspective. Uh, yes, Please. sorry for not being available, but I have an 18 year old uh, baby named Phoenix, the fluff ball, and he was screaming my cat. So I have now put him under the bed cover. So we will see. Um, listening to this seminar, I actually had some uh, some more um, interesting in my mind points to just uh, put out. And I will have a disclaimer immediately. I have not yet read your book, so I will have to read it. And uh, so I can't comment on your book. 
Um, when it comes to in the beginning, um, it was talked about evergreening and under evergreening was um, the SPCs and orphan drug protection and data protection. In my mind, that's not evergreening because that is based on the normal rights that patents provide. The reason we have SPCs is that um, when you file for patents, you can't wait. It's not that you can file early. You are forced to file early because if you don't file early, we all would to want, to when, uh, want to wait actually to have more data in our patents, but we can't because a part of the invention will become public at early stages. So we are forced to file early and it's an everlasting problem um, in any company that we have to wait until at least we have a basis for patent protection as a priority application, but we still can't wait too long because then it will become public. And especially in smaller companies, as opposed to larger companies, um, putting out uh, development data is very important because otherwise you will get no funding for anything unless you show that you're actually producing and developing. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that we have seen during COVID now that um, you know the process with EMA and FDA can go quickly. In real life, outside of COVID, that's not the case. It takes very long to get through the regulatory process. And with respect to COVID even now, we're back to normal more or less. So the companies that are developing COVID vaccines now do not have the benefit the early companies had to get through quickly because now the normal pace is back in place at uh, EMA and FDA. So I just wanted to, to make that point that many times my company, and I will have this disclaimer, we don't do personalized medicine and uh, in the sense that you're talking about and um, whatever I say here has nothing to do with my company. Um, what can be done is, of course, subsets of personalized medicine in the sense that uh, uh, you were talking about previously in Sweden, you consider also subset of population. Uh, you have a marker, for example, that you find that a subset of the population will respond better to your cancer treatment. That's a larger scale personalized medicine. And uh, then you can have patent protection potentially uh, on those points. Um, what is important for pharmaceuticals, biotech companies, it was true when I did my LLM is 97 to 2001. It is still true now is predictability. That is what is needed, because as we have seen now in the US, um, things can change quickly and it changes retroactively because a patent is filed as a priority application. It's good for even in the US, finally, thank you, uh, 20 years from filing of your priority application. And during that time, law change. And the biggest change so far has been in the United States. And it's not only Myriad, it's also several cases in high tech that affects biotech. So basically, I'm not gonna go into all the case law um, for the US, but basically um, they, in my mind, they have adopted a little bit from the European approach to computer programs. So they look at claims and then they say, oh, this part is naturally occurring and that part is naturally occurring. And if we 
don't look at those parts, everything else is just obvious. So, so that is how these claims are looked at on a very basic level in the United States. So what is problematic again for, for developing since it takes such a long time and it's so much resources going in to each project, which at the end of the day can fail. Um, my company sure had a big fail <laughs> of a cancer therapy at the end of the day. Well, then you have to start over or hopefully as yes, in our case, we had other projects, but some companies would not have other projects. They have, as the US expression is all eggs in one basket. And then that company will just disappear. So clarity is what is needed. And uh, I personally came into the company uh, I work for now from the litigation side. So I supervise patent prosecutors, but I personally do not sit and do patent prosecution. So I always look at um, all patent aspects from a litigation perspective, because I, I, I tell my patent prosecutors is that um, if we move forward on patents, we need to have a strong patent. We, we do, do not want to have a fluff patent that cannot be enforced or with claims that are worded in a way that uh, who can enforce it. So th this notion that, that so many seem to have that everyone is just filing to stop everything and, and putting in whatever in patent applications, I don't think it's true for most pharma. Um, it can be in, in some instances, but we truly need strong patents. And therefore, the whole regulatory process, if we go into that aspect, is problematic. Because again, we can't wait. So we have, if we have animal data, preclinical, most likely we will have to file. Would we like to wait for, for human clinical data? Oh, we would, but it's not possible because then the invention would already in parts at least have been made public and we would not be able to obtain a patent. So what we try to do, and it's true for any of these type of inventions, there's no difference with personal medicine or other type medicine in this way, you have to have a solid first finding. And then you have to consider what type of claims are useful and how strong those claims are in the sense, can these be supported from the application first file? That is our goal every time we file a patent application. Sometimes we're not that lucky because sometimes also internally, um, there are other groups in the company that might want to go out and talk about it. Happens all the time. And then you have to put a filing in before that happens that might not be optimal. When it comes to, we do vaccines, we do cancer treatments based on viral backbones. Um, we have instances where there have been subset of populations looked at. Uh, we have still never filed a patent application on that aspect. And the reason is that they are so hard to uh, support and get patents on. And my question to myself is always, well, would I want to enforce it? Because it costs a lot of money to go in and enforce a patent, especially in the US, which is the trickiest part now. So unless you are pretty certain that you have a strong enough patent in my mind, 
um, at least for the type of company I work for, we might not want to go in and, and enforce. There might be other companies with bigger, <laughs> bigger funds that uh, would do that, but we would certainly hesitate doing that. Um, so that is, I just wanted to put a little bit of perspective on some of the issues um, that has been discussed here. Uh, when it comes to another aspect of patents is that you want as a company and especially a company that might need to collaborate with a bigger company or partner with a bigger company, the number one question is always, what are your patents? It's always a due diligence on the patent portfolio. Many times or sometimes when the product has been in development for a long time, uh, in practical life, the data protection is actually the stronger one, the more useful one. So that is also something that we always discuss. And um, uh, the data protection is a good protection if you have a complex product that um, requires um, a lot of clinical trials or trials to show that it's the same and so forth and whatever regulatory now required for that particular product. So that also depends on what type of product it is as I have finally <laughs> realized from our regulatory folks. And um, if you have a product that is very hard to produce, for example, in addition that it would require a lot of clinical trials, then data protection is a good protection. If you have an easier type product and you only need to do a couple of studies still, um, even though you can't rely on the data of another company, then data protection might not be that useful. Um, so, those are my, my input uh, into the discussion that I hope we will have, um, that um, it, it's practically, there are a lot of other considerations. It's not just having a patent and not having a patent um, that we, we're talking about. Thank you so much, Lee. It's so interesting to hear the perspective of the industry and uh, the perspective from someone who um, works both in, in uh, Europe and in the US um, with these issues. I hope we come back to, to these uh, very important aspects during our discussion. And now we will continue looking at industry perspectives uh, with Hokan, uh, who has a very nice title to his presentation, To Dance or Not to Dance? To Dance, of course. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Francesca. I ran into some uh, technical issues here, but uh, I think I have resolved them now and should be sharing the PowerPoint presentation now. You can see me switch slides, right? You're not sharing anymore, Hokan. I'm not sharing anymore. Okay. No. If you can do it again. So wait. Um. I'm sharing now, right? Yes. Okay, so, sorry about that. Uh, so the title of my presentation is To Dance or Not To Dance, The Patent Dance. Our work at X-Frame Biopharma, we are a drug development company in the field of biosimilars. The term biosimilars is used for biological generics. 
we are driven by the belief that if there is a treatment, it should be available for all. And we actually achieve this beautiful vision by uh, lowering the cost of production. Uh, we produce antibodies. We use expression vectors, which we insert into host cells and to express the proteins. And we have a, a big group of R&D science, scientists who are experts in DNA engineering. They engineer these expression vectors, which are typically circular, as well as the whole cell to produce more protein. And that is actually how we achieve uh, the low cost of production. We used to have a very small patent portfolio, only two patents before 2020. However, when I came on board, we started transforming business secrets into intellectual property rights. And these columns show the accumulated number of patents and patent applications, 2020, 2021, and before that also. We actually uh, at a total number of 25 patents and patent applications, and they are mostly based on uh, the protection of expression vectors and host cells and methods of using those. The first product, which we will probably start selling 2023, after them, uh, this product being approved by the EMEA and FDA is referred to as exlucane. Uh, it will comprise, it will be a vial comprising an antibody fragment called ranibizumab. And there are some patent, up, what am I saying, publications, um, were, which uh, discussed these uh, research conducted on tailoring treatment strategies for ranibizumab. The originator sells uh, ranibizumab under the trademark of Lysantis, and the originator is Genentech. And they've outlicensed uh, sales outside of USA to Novartis. Our uh, IP policy is not to infringe others' IP rights. In other words, we wait for patent expiry. However, we also do file oppositions for revoking uh, competitors' patents if needed. We operate in an extremely litigious environment. As an example, uh, Merck had to Merck, which sells Ktruda, which is a trademark for pembrolizumab, antibody pembrolizumab. Merck had to actually pay $625 million to Bristol Myers Squibb and Ono in a settlement plus ongoing royalties. Bristol Myers Squibb and Ono sell um, uh, an antibody referred to, or trademark, or a pharmaceutical referred to as Optivo, which, com which uh, comprises the antibody Nivolumab. Actually, if you go to our homepage and look into the biosimilars that is under development, the X-Brain borrow both the Merck product, Keytruda, as well as the bristol myers Squibb uh, product, Optivo, is in our list of uh, compounds that we are de developing. So we know what to expect in the future. However, although um, we can expect some uh, probable litigation in the future, we do, there is a savior. Someone can save us from this. If you are into popular culture, you've probably seen the film Dune and the savior there is Al-Mahdi, the guided one in the Netflix series, Messiah, it's Al-Masi in soccer, it's the special one. Uh, Mourinho in the Star Wars films, it's Luke Skywalker. And in the field of biosimilars, our savior or messiah is Obama or the so-called Obamacare. And you're just probably wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Soon it will be clear. Um, on March 23, 2010, President Obama signed into law the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which most of us know as the Affordable Care Act, which upon enactment amended the Public Health Service Act, the PHSA, and other statutes to create an abbreviated license, licensure pathway for biological products that are demonstrated to be highly similar. That is by similar to or interchangeable with US Food and Drug Administration, FDA approved biological product. These statutory provisions are commonly referred to as the Biologics Prize Competition and Innovation Act of 2009, the BPCIA. However, the, the, the term BPCIA is not used by us 
patent attorneys and other IP professionals, we refer to this as the patent dance. And this dance you only have in the USA. So this is kind of US centric. To the right here, we see a satirical picture or illustration of Barack Obama holding a syringe and it says, this is going to hurt. And obviously it's going to hurt the originators because the so-called patent dance or the BPCIA gives biosimilar companies like X-Brain certain advantages. So what are they? What has changed in the gameplay? So before the patent dance, that is before the BPCIA, you, you had market entry and the originator would file an infringement suit against you uh, at a district court. Uh, such as New Jersey District Court, the Delaware Eastern uh, Texas District Court. And the originator, originator, sometimes referred to as a reference product sponsor, would play with a closed poker hand. Uh, this means that as a biosimilar company, you did not know the patents that would be asserted against you. Of course, you would have conducted your freedom to operate searches and infringement searches. However, sometimes you might miss a document or two, or the, bio, the originator might assert a document that relates to something like how to culture uh, the, the cells, et cetera. However, sorry for the spelling mistake, mistake, it should say, say with. So with the patent dance option, so it is an option. You don't have, it's this so-called patent dance, the BPCIA, it's not mandatory. However, if you enter this optional phase, which comes before an infringement trial, you force the originator to play with an open, open poker hand. You force the originator to show or to share with you the patents that they will assert against you. So how does this work? How does the patent dance, the BPCIA work? It's administered by the FDA. So this is, so what is the gameplay? Well, when your biosimilar licensure application is accepted by the FDA, you uh, indicate to the originator, which is referred to as the RPS, the reference product sponsor that you would like to enter. The BPCIA, you share uh, the BLA, the, bi the biosimilar application, uh, or parts of it with the originator. And then the originator, the RPS, provides you with a patent list. And in that patent list, sometimes referred to as the three patent list, they list the patents which they believe that the biosimilar applicant is infringing. And then you get the chance to respond. So within 60 days, you have to respond to this list and indicate that you fall outside the scope of these listed patents. Hopefully you fall outside. If you don't, then uh, it can get tough. Uh, you might need to start having certain uh, discussions with the originator. And then um, to, your, to buy similar company's response, the reference product sponsor, the originator has the chance to respond also and indicate, oh, you have stated that you're not infringing our patent, but we are of a diverging opinion, et cetera. So you have these types of discussions. And at the end here, it's not the end, but uh, you have to, or the biosimilar applicant and the originator, the reference product sponsor, uh, should agree on the patents that are relevant to the case and which the reference product sponsor will use in the following infringement lawsuit because there will be one potentially. However, as a biosimilar applicant, you can object, you can protest to this 3A list and indicate that you don't accept this list of patents. And then you provide the list of patents which you believe are important, but you're not infringing. And you exchange this with the reference product sponsor. At the end of the day, at the end of this, process, the reference product sponsor, the originator can file an infringement lawsuit against you. And this is an eight month process. So maybe you're thinking, but if they're going to file this lawsuit, so what's the point of going into this? There are two major advantages. The fact that you, you force the originator to share 
the patents that they will allege you, you're infringing. Plus, once you get hold of those patents, you can start writing a defense, which you have already done within these 60 days, but even a more uh, lengthy defense that can be used in the uh, infringement case. Plus, typically you would like to revoke these patents, the patents in the 3A list. So you can start uh, uh, doing the work, the preparation for filing an inter partes review before the PTAB Patents and uh, Trademarks Appeal Board of the USPTA. So these are the two main advantages, preparing your defense and attack where, within, these, within this eight month period. And the cool thing is that this 3A list becomes public and it's listed in the purple book. And you can actually write the name of the antibody, either the active compound, the ranibizumab, uh, uh, or the name of the originator drug. And interestingly, if you write ranibizumab, you will see that there was a patent dance. Genentech had been drawn into a patent dance by a company, and Genentech asserted this column of patents. And one can actually, if one does a Google search on Ranibizumab or Lucentis uh, by a similar, one will identify that a company called Biogen had uh, a Ranibizumab by a similar approved by the FDA. So this was published on the internet on the September 20. And just four days later, on another internet publication, it was indicated that Samsung Biotis and Biogen who cooperate, that they had struck a licensing deal with Genentech, the originator, which means that there will never be an infringement lawsuit. So if we don't know the terms of the agreement, if, but if we would guess, Biogen and Samsung Biotis went into this uh, patent dance, Genentech must have provided a list, but then realized that this list, this alleged, these patents that allegedly you know, Biogen or something by Epis were uh, infringing, they had no value. So I, I, I believe that Genentech must be, have been cornered and realized that there was no point going into a lawsuit. It's better to have a settlement or a licensing agreement, which will be which could, would be beneficial for both parties. So this is a perfect example of how to avoid an infringement lawsuit as a, by a similar company. That is, you go into the patent dance, force the originator to show their cards, uh, and then maybe indicate to the originator that those patents are not uh, relevant. So this is actually the final slide from me. As you can see, Biogen beat us to it. This is a competitor of ours. We would have liked to be the first company to uh, sell uh, Ranibizumab biosimilar, but they beat us to it. There's another company or constellation, Coheris and Formicon, I think are working together. So these are the two companies that we're competing with. Although Biogen is a competitor, they just, just just a couple of weeks ago, they went into one of our biosimilar project as an investor. So they are both a business partner in the case of Sertolizumab or Simsia, which is sold by US, UCB. But in the case of Ranibizumab, they are a competitor. And this is you know, my final slide on this patent dance. So the question is, as a biosimilar company, do you want to enter the this patent dance or not, that is to dance or not to dance. So that's all for me. Thank you very much, Hokan, very interesting. And on that note, we um, leave the floor to Ulf, who will continue talking about commercialization strategies in the med field, right? Thank you, Francesca. Uh, I'm really happy to be invited to celebrate your book uh, and partake in this discussion. Uh, so starting off a bit in Francesca's book in a more practical way, I am an academic, a professor of law, but focusing a bit on this more, more management side of intellectual property in relation to this. And what I think is so interesting uh, in this discussion, but also in Francesca's book, on the one hand we have the IP regime and then we have the more regulatory regimes and how do that affect the stakeholders working in this field. Starting off in this uh, setting of person-centric era, uh, uh, this slide should be like that. 
So now it's in presentation mode, right? Yeah. So we discussed the personalized medicine and the precision medicine. Uh, broaden the picture a bit. I have a, a relatively large research project focusing on the development from the from the medical technology side. So I will have a little bit of that kind of angle on this. And discussed in this kind of setting nowadays is this kind of paradigm shift as we are relating to in different regards that we have this uh, data driven but also more broadly digital driven transformation where uh, we have the the personalized medicine and precision side but that is directly linked to a development how we work with medtech but also to to a, a broader discussion in relation to what does it mean that the patient becomes more involved and the specific conditions of the of the patient is more sort of recognized and you have this kind of partnership between the healthcare and the patient kind of approach to to discussing the the person centered healthcare and i had opportunity to be part of the governance board for a person centered healthcare kind of center and they increasingly start to talk. In the beginning, it was only healthcare, but more and more medtech, and also discussing the precision kind of approach. And nowadays, in policy, we are more also familiar with this kind of precision health kind of discussion that that is related to this. It's a lot of things going on here, of course. The ambition from my side is more like understanding the kind of the setting. So, so if we take uh, an example, which I will do and dig into a little bit. So starting off in a patent application, not discussing the patentability and such, but instead bringing forward a kind of a solution that what does it typically encompass when it comes to different kind of solutions and how we relate to that in this kind of more thinking of what is expected of us that work with, with uh, uh, intellectual asset management on one side and regulatory compliance on the, on the other side. I will come back to that uh, case, which I think a bit captures. So you have uh, the, the picture here that illustrates it a bit, right? That it's related to a, a device where you um, have this kind of pipette, the smart pipette, and you have a blood example, blood sample, then that is analyzed and you build up the data where it's kind of a, a, a device which is related to the data management and then related to, to the feedback mechanism in different regards. I will come back to it. But you can see in a way, trying to find an example that we could discuss a bit from this general approach of, of intellectual asset management. So one of those obvious things, which I think is kind of obvious for everyone that comes from practice, if you have this kind of legal uh, approach, we, we work on two, two levels. Coming from the academic side, it's not necessarily obvious in the same way. That on the one hand, we have like the law and the legal sources that we study, and which we, in this case, like patent law. And then we have the side where we use our knowledge of patent law and we build patent portfolios, we create patent organizations, we do patent licensing, we do this kind of creating the legal resources and we in different ways use it. Of course, that is also legal skills. So, so we work on both these kind of levels, but from this kind of more academic side, we are used to, to a large extent, to study what goes as a legal skill to understand what goes on in patent law, but not necessarily in the same way have studied to find different ways from a legal point of view to study what goes on, how the legal development, so to say, occurs. And this, I think, is, is uh, quite interesting in the setting of, of uh, uh, Francesca's book as well. Understanding the impact, the impact on firms and firm behaviors in relation to when we set up rules which are interacting in a relatively complex way. So from my kind of med tech perspective in this, Focusing on this one hand, we have the intellectual asset side where we have IPR law, trade secrets law, contract law, etc., that we use in the legal claiming of intellectual assets and building up the resources. On the one hand, we have the regulators, and here I use uh, the MedTech example, where we are going to use the fundamental regulatory regimes in the setting of Europe and how that affects the legal governance for innovations where we have to be in regulatory compliance and how can we see how these two relatively sophisticated legal approaches becoming more and more intertwined in different ways. And I think that is 
also captured in, in Francesca's book. So from the more practical side, of course, working with this in practice, oops, one slide too quickly. So we can see that there's a, a number of capabilities here that is typically uh, needs to be focused on. In this setting that we are in now, we typically start off by claiming and managing the IPR assets, the, the patentable inventions and, and the, the science that can be protected and the copyrighted work, etc., etc. Or from that matter, the trade secret management side, uh, which we in a way see as relatively closely related to it. The contract management side, of course, all of us in a way is aware of that we are interested in control and trade secrets is a way to control, to complement uh, the IPR side. So it's also using contracts in different ways to enable control. Increasingly, we also recognize that how we organize and structure will affect and then the regulatory compliance come in as well, which is also something that we've discussed a lot there, how this enables in a way, a way to, to also think when it comes to intellectual asset management, which related to, to the systems here. So for me, this is a way to, to kind of set the stage for a broader discussion that what are expected of us and how does this work? And this will, of course, firms becomes more and more sophisticated in this and how to uh, uh, being able to create uh, control positions that are strong in different ways. What we don't necessarily discuss so much, however, uh, is still a natural starting point to dig into understanding the technology and the knowledge and the data per se. So this is a little bit the, the approach here, which I think in a way the, the person centric in general illustrates for us that dig digitization moves us into thinking in a number of, of resources where we start off and see, okay, we have a number of, of technology assets and how and in which different ways can we control that and how is that related to how we're going to create our business in different ways. So using this kind of digital starting point into this uh, and see how that relates to, to the development in, in med tech or for that matter also in pharmaceuticals. How do we use hardware related solutions, network and communication related solutions, software related solutions, software related instructions uh, uh, in different ways like the code as such, databases, raw data and process data that we needed or algorithms in different ways. So this, of course, are a way to, to approach it. But if we analyze what we are doing from this point of view and see what kind of resources do we have here. Focusing on this digital development in relation to, we can see that there are three primary spheres. One sphere is the more hardware sphere. One is the more digital uh, solutions when it comes to the software sphere as such. And then there's connectivity sphere. So a lot of the solutions are pushed in different ways from, from uh, these three different spheres. So just going into this case, it could have taken any case from reality. Here I use open information from the, from the, uh, the, the patent literature. So the point here is not to dig into what is actually patentable or not, but more to illustrate this kind of solutions. So here we have this kind of integrated smart point of care biosensor. It's an early research and innovation project coming from a university, which is quite interesting and that they, it's a, a piece. So, so the main thing here is, is the, this kind of, of device where you, where you uh, have this biomarker solutions and where you look into the individual nature of the blood and then gather data around that, which is the basis for um, uh, uh, then future treatments, etc. So it is the device. And it's built into this kind of system, which we have discussed a bit, a cloud computer knowledge database, that kind of approach. And you can see if you look into the smart pipette related to the model platform, it's a number of these kind of digital solutions that is related to this, that illustrates the nature of this kind of, of, of tech solution. Using this intellectual asset thinking around this, not having the ambition to narrow down what is protected here, but yet just get a picture of what is typically assets included here. 
So we have the hardware solutions, we have the software solutions, a number of them. We have data that is necessary for it in relation to it, processed and raw data. We have the database solutions integrated. And these are typically the resources here that can be controlled. Then the question is, of course, what in this is patentable? But from a firm point of view, it is, of course, the full picture that we're interested in. What can be done and controlled to enable best possible leverage to, to achieve this? What is perhaps even more interesting in a way is, right, is in a way to see just by doing this kind of intellectual asset analytics on a project, we can start to quite early see what, what does this mean from a regulatory compliance point of view. So sticking here to, to the setting in, in Europe, we can see that in relation to, to the IVDR sphere, the in vitro sphere, and starting off directly to what is needed to be dealt with from a, a conformity, from a regulatory compliance point of view, we can see that, that we have to follow a number of standards in relation to this to be in compliance with the, with the IVDR, but possibly also uh, 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 other regulatory me mechanisms, and we do know that GDPR, as we already heard, is crucial in this kind of regulatory compliance. So, we know that there is this kind of interaction, there is a huge system, and this is what is so interesting with this development, not only focusing on personalized medicine, also bringing in the med tech development and the digitization and pushing us toward being more patient centric, that a lot of solution is going to be under the regulatories when it comes to compliance here. And the med tech area here is moving quickly to when it comes to setting up new standards in relation to be compliant with the general regulation on European Union level. And we know that as lawyers, we tend to start off from the regulation as such, but we know that there are layers of the layers that we need to be in compliance with here of following the, the, the way of, of thinking as well, of course, from, from, from the drug development side. So this is for me what is so interesting when having this kind of discussion here, that we can see like development in both sides. The more we dig into intellectual asset thinking, we can also see that this will help us in early phases to start to plan how to deal with the regulatory side of things and what you really need to be dealt with. Not being perhaps a big and large firm here, being in a relatively early research and innovation phase. What do we need to be able to structure and deal with? To be able to have control positions on the other hand, to be compliant. And how can this, so to say, build upon each other? We have already heard in different discussions here that understanding the regulatories will help us to broaden our thinking when it comes to claiming intellectual assets. Claiming intellectual assets and controlling them is not only by IPR, it's not only by trade secrets, it's not only by contracts, it's also about being compliance and using that. In the other direction, we can see understanding intellectual asset in a more thorough way, we will foresee under what kind of regulatory regimes we have to be, compli be in compliance with, being able to put the products on the market. Moving into the era of artificial intelligence, we know that this is, here's a lot of things happening and it's gonna be like that for us for quite a long time where new and new regulatory regimes will be introduced to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulf. Uh, we have very little time for discussion, but I think we um, um, have discussed through the presentations a lot of interesting issues. We have one question that is not answered in the Q&As. What are your thoughts regarding the direct to consumer business engagement diagnostic models, such as the one proposed by genomes.io? And how would such models affect business and IP strategies of companies in the PM field, in the personalized medicine field? Anyone that would like to answer? If I'm not mistaken, this genomes.io, it's, uh, it's a company where you can get your DNA screened, right? And you can participate in research. Um, oh, is it like 23andMe? 
that you are I've, I've just read a little bit about them that you are able to to feel how do you say particip participating in research and at the same time get the screening of your dna maybe it's so there, there, there are companies um one in the bay area that you know i know people working at 23 and me um, that was not the notion that you participated in research. It was the notion that you were screened um, for um, different aspects of what supposedly you could be prone to in terms of disease based on genes. Mm. Now they want to use it for research. Now they want to sell it. I think, Hannah, did you want to... Thanos has uh, written here. I don't know if I, if I'm able, if I write answer live. I don't know. Can can then Thanos explain to us, Eleonora? Can mm -hmm. Thanos come live? <laughs> I think uh, that uh, if uh, they raise their hand, we can allow them to talk. So if please, uh, Thanos uh, can raise their hand so that we are allowed uh, to unmute uh, him. Here he is. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Well, thank you for the very interesting talks. I, I would just, I'm approaching this whole field from the genome sequencing, DNA sequencing uh, industry, let's say, and interest. So I was, uh, I was skeptical. I am skeptical with respect to, to this direct to consumer uh, sequencing, let's say, trend. It, di it did start with 23andMe and other companies that offered the ancestry, uh, you know, aspect of DNA, but it has evolved. And Genomes IO actually says that it offers uh, 30, 30 times uh, whole genome sequencing, like um, medicinal, uh, medicinally relevant genome sequencing. And so it would be interesting to, to check this type of, of business models that are, are evolving. And uh, I think that this will greatly affect the way that companies do business in the future. Um, people are very concerned with their health data. And this will be uh, even more pronounced when we're talking about genetic data in the future. So it would be interesting to, to take this into consideration when people are discussing IP strategies because what needs to be protected might be subject to change in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting um, comment. Because I was also wondering in relation to that when we uh, were listening to the presentations, we talked a lot about what are the possibilities of protecting personalized medicine and what are what is the regulatory framework uh, that applies but we uh, i was kind of wondering what are the needs of personalized medicine in terms of protection uh just trying to you know turn around the table because for instance in the atmp regulation we know in in europe at least that it is uh in principle, not used, right? Uh, I don't know, Lara, you have worked with that regulation, right? Because in these regulations, uh, in this regulation, therapies that are very close to personalized therapies are included. You mean ATPs? Yes. Unfortunately, I have. My focus has been on biomarkers and uh, diagnostic tests. Yeah. I can't answer on it, please. No, I understand. No, but I, I mean, my point is kind of, uh, we as lawyers, not all of us are lawyers here, but, but a lawyer's perspective is how do we put a, a, a subject matter X under our known umbrella, under our known framework. And I'm wondering, does personalized medicine have the same needs protection-wise as uh, other pharmaceuticals, other medical methods? 
what do you think? It depends on what your business method or what your business is, right? If you are a diagnostic company, uh, because diagnostics are important for personalized medicine in various ways, uh, and you're developing these diagnostics, I'm sure they would like to protect it. Um, because otherwise, what business do they really have? Um, so I can just answer it from that perspective. Personally, when it comes to um, 23andMe and uh, those type companies and they are screening for disease potentials, uh, I'm just going to take a step back and say that um, the knowledge is not there. Uh, just because you have one gene that might be implicated in one type of disease, the development of that disease can depend on, on 50 other factors. And um, personally, I wouldn't take this test because I'm not going to go around worrying about getting a disease that I most likely will never get. And in the US, also several of my friends, they are also very prone to take medications even as precautions <laughs> or something they don't have and might never have. And I, I've heard the, the people and these are educated people and they obsess about whatever diseases they could potentially get. So um, I'm just looking at it from a completely different perspective when I say that, yeah, I'm not gonna do it. Thank you, Lee. Hold down. Now, uh, as Thanos indicated, there are people that are uh, critical of 23andMe and similar companies. I have done their tests and you have the choice of uh, being excluded from the health report. So you can just pay for the ancestry if you're worried that your uh, data will be used for various things. Uh, I personally think that uh, or hope that the companies, pharma companies that are involved in these types of projects, they, they, that they do something good, that, that they do something good with this. And I, I believe they will. I don't think that there is bad faith from GSK's side or any other pharma company that is collaborating with 23andMe. So I hope that they are doing something good and I'll like to believe that they are. So I've done this test. I even uh, tested my cat's DNA. I haven't gotten any results <laughs> yet. So it's, it's done by Base Paws in USA, another company that is focused on this. So yeah. So it's a it's a fun test. So uh, yeah, don't be afraid of it. At least I'm not. So thank you so much, Duncan. A final note, maybe. Uh, no, Francesca. I've been very impressed with the panel discussions. Uh, I posted some comments in the Q and A as well. Uh, so I will leave leave my comments at that. Thank you, Hannah. No, I, I was just thinking about your, your last question that I think that it's important that there are some incentives for, for the industry, uh, because if, if that's not the case, uh, I think that the development will be uh, much slower and, and more difficult. Thank you. And Roberto? Thank you, Helena Taylor, for the comments. Thank you. There was one more question, right, from Lawrence, but I cannot see. Lawrence yes. Cullen, I think, you want to ask something. Yes. 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 Lawrence. You're now allowed to speak. Please yes. go ahead. You can unmute yourself, Lawrence. No, I, I I think there is a there is a mistake. I, I didn't have a question. I didn't I didn't oh. post a question. So apologies. Uh, for all the, right, the no problem, no problem. Okay, uh, Ulf, a final note. You are satisfied. It's yeah. four o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I think Eleonora, it's up to you to close the seminar. For my part, thank you so much for participating. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentations and. Looking forward to more discussions on this very interesting subject. And uh, on my side, uh, I can just uh, echo your uh, final remarks. It has been a, a very enlightening uh, discussion. So thanks so much to all the speakers uh, who have participated. Thanks to the participants uh, for engaging in the discussion. 
Uh, thanks, Alva, for uh, your support. And uh, congratulations once again, Francesca, for uh, the publication of your book. We look forward uh, uh, to reading more from you, as well as to all the speakers who have joined us uh, this afternoon. So thank you, everyone. Uh, if you would like uh, to uh, be informed about the future uh, ETHIM activities, uh, please uh, just visit our website. Uh, and we look forward uh, to seeing you uh, at the next uh, available occasion. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.